Hello, my friend, Pastor Kurt here and Pastor Andrew. Welcome to Good Friday Services. You know, from the beginning of Christianity, Christians have taken the Friday before Resurrection Sunday simply to reflect on the suffering of Christ, the price that he paid for you and I. And we're going to do that right now. We're going to literally, across all of our campuses, every single Bayside campus, we're going to read the story and worship God. We're going to read the story and worship God. And then at the end, after all of our different campus pastors have led us, we're going to share communion together. I want to encourage you, at some point in the service, whoever's able to, just sneak off and get a cup of juice. This is from my kitchen. I get a little bread. This is from our lunch. And together, let's show our unity in loving God and worshiping him for what he's done for us on the cross by celebrating the Lord's Supper. You may be socially distancing in a house in California or somewhere else across the United States, but we're going to take you to the city of Jerusalem. Through the scriptures, we're going to travel from an upper room. We're going to go to a garden. Then we're going to go to a high priest's house. We're going to go to a Roman praetorium. And then we're going to go along the Via della Rosa and just go outside the city wall. And we're quite, quite literally, we're going to lead you to the cross. And we're going to sing that song. So join us in worship now as we sing, Lead Me to the Cross. Though we may not be in the same building, we are still worshiping the same God. So wherever you're at right now, let's just lift up the name of Jesus together.
Hello, everyone. This is Jason and Stephanie Kane alongside Kelly and Scott Center. We'll be reading from Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 7 tonight, to read the story and the account of Jesus with his last supper as he was about to go to the cross with his disciples. Stephanie. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I will tell you I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. And Jesus said to them, The king of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and even to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me.
Tyler, I'm with Wesley Town, and we're going to continue reading in Luke chapter 22, the account of Jesus' arrest and trial, starting in verse 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me, but this is your hour, when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him to the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman. I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law met together and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he had hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressed him in an elegant robe. Then they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together to the chief priests, the rulers, and the people and said to them, You brought this man as one who is inciting the people to rebellion. I've examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. 
Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us, as you can see. He has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, away with this man, release to us Bar Barabbas. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he had spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for and surrendered Jesus to their will. continue to read together the account of Holy Week. We're going to continue reading in Luke 23 verses 26 through 49. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on the way from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and he said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. 
for the time will come when you will say, blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore or breasts that never nursed. Then they'll say to the mountains, fall on us and the hills cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even snared at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man had done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn into two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. The satyrians seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Hi guys, I'm so glad you joined us today. And I just want to take a minute to talk about what we're celebrating today. Um, we call it Good Friday. I like to call it Perfect Friday, and you'll find out why in a little bit here. But I want to start off by giving you all this tidbit of information just right off the top. And that is, I want us to know that it's impossible to have the majesty and the magnificence of a miraculous resurrection on a Sunday without having the darkness and the death of the crucifixion on a Friday. You can't have one without the other. And I think most people in the moment that we find ourselves in right now are thinking things like, they're overwhelmed by the darkness um, and the uncertainty that they we're living in right now through the coronavirus crisis. And many people find themselves thinking about how little this world is to be trusted now and how little this world really has to offer ultimately. And I think a lot of people are wondering, where is God in this moment? Um, has God turned his back on us? Has God uh, looked away from his people? Does God really love his people? And the answer to that question is found in the text that Tyrone just read. And the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Yes, God deeply loves us and he's, he's here with us as we walk through this together. Uh, the passage is also a down payment of sorts. It's a down payment for the future the future promise that there will be one day, a Sunday, to the coronavirus crisis. We're going through a Friday right now, but one day we'll be raised up out of it and God's people will be secure. And so I, I, wanna, I wanna emphasize, there are three reasons why we can know that God loves us and they're shown through Christ, through what he did on Good Friday. And the first one is this, Jesus overcame all of our wrongs with a perfect right. The text that Tyrone said, uh, read in Luke 23, 33 through 34 said, when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them. How does one muster up the energy 
while being executed to say, Father, forgive them. Those who are having me killed, forgive them. And I'm not talking about, uh, I guess, his injustice. Have you ever felt shafted? Have you ever felt jobbed? Um, and not to the degree of you, you had a flight delay. Uh, not to the degree of you didn't get everything you paid for at the McDonald's drive through I'm talking about genuine offense, genuine injustice. Have you ever spent time in prison for a crime you didn't commit? Or if you've ever been physically abused or if you've ever been treated like something less than human because of your skin color or your gender or what you believe. If you've ever suffered injustice to that degree, take comfort in knowing that we have a God who suffered just like we have and just like maybe we are now. We have a God who has felt what we felt. There's no other God out there that has ever felt what we felt because there really is no other God. And thankfully, we have a God who made it all right for us. We have a God who did the work of restitution and restoration for us. We have a God who demonstrated his love for us by suffering through a massive injustice for us that we put on him and said while doing it, forgive them for they know not what they do. Incredible, that kind of love. Second thing is Jesus lived the perfect life. The text in Luke 23, 40 through 41 says, But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus lived the life that no human could live. He was perfectly sinless. Jesus did no wrong in God's eyes or in anyone else's eyes while he walked the earth. That's why he was the perfect propitiation for our sin, the perfect substitute for our sin. And even though Jesus offers us his perfect love as a genuinely perfect free gift, for some reason, human beings just can't try, can't stop from trying to, to obtain the love of God, to earn the love of God. You can actually see this in the things people do to try to please God and in almost every other religious faith, you see this. From extremes of Islam to the penance of Catholics, as human beings, we do some really weird stuff, I'm sorry to say, to try to earn the love of God. It's like the story of the priest, the pastor, and the rabbi. I hope you haven't heard this one. They were trying to please God so much that they went to the extreme of trying to convert a mountain bear to faith. They each went out to the mountains and found a bear and later got together to share their exploits about their conversion processes with bears. And the priest went first and he said, when I found my bear, I began by reading the catechism to him. And he said, then he allowed me to sprinkle him with holy water. And next week, we're planning that bear's first communion. But the pastor went next and he said, I found my bear by a stream and I began preaching to him out of the gospel of John. The bear was so mesmerized by God's word that he allowed me to baptize him right there in the water in the creek. Then they both looked down at the rabbi who was propped up on his stretcher with both arms and both legs in a cast. The rabbi started off by telling them, looking back, maybe I shouldn't have started with circumcision. Now that's going a long way to try to earn the love and the favor of God. But the reality is God's love is on full display for us. It's, it's not like God hasn't proven that God's love shows through and is demonstrated most fully and thoroughly in his life as a human being, living a perfect life for us. And then number three, Jesus paid the perfect price. Jesus paid the perfect penalty. Again, in Luke 23, 43 through 46, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the, in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. And it's at that time in the Gospel of John, during, during John's rendering of the life of Christ, that it says, Jesus said, it is finished. In the Greek, that is to telestai. And to telestai, to telestai means it is finished. But it's also a, a, a word that's used for the phrase for, for when people would put a stamp on receipts 
that, that a bill had been paid for, it was to Telestai. And it's in Jesus' death, he's putting that stamp on us. You, you know that stamp that finance departments and, and maybe a, accountants assistants use when they're processing bills? Paid, paid, paid. Jesus stamps you and stamps me and stamps everyone else paid in full with his perfect life and his perfect price paid. And he paid it with his broken body and he paid it with his shed blood. <clears throat> and in the church, we have a beautiful sacrament to memorialize that broken body and that shed blood. It's called the sacrament of communion. And so I, I want to hand it over now. Our, our pastors from our Adventure Christian Church, Bayside Adventure, James and Michael, they want to take us and walk us through the process of communion. God bless you. Well, thanks for that message, Bob. This is our opportunity now on this Good Friday to take a moment and celebrate the sacraments of communion. This is a tradition that's been shared with the Christian faith over thousands of years, and we get to participate in that. So go grab your bread, your juice, your cookies, milk, whatever you have. It's not the elements that are special, but what they represent that are. That's exactly right, you know, and you heard earlier in the service about the Last Supper. And it's the time that Jesus gathered all of his disciples for a meal that they would commonly have together. Interestingly enough, knowing what was to happen in the next week, in the next moments actually, he wanted to make sure he left them with some detailed instructions. On the night, that Jesus was betrayed, he took these elements. The first one he took was he took the bread and he did something very interesting. He took the bread, he raised it, he blessed it, and then he broke it. And we often say here that when Jesus reminded us that his body was broken, that it wasn't just that it would be broken and left broken, but that it would be made whole. It's a reminder to us on this Good Friday that no matter what areas of our lives feel broken in this season, whether it's our health, finances, relationships, in the middle of all of this, Jesus doesn't run from our brokenness. He actually sits right here with us in the middle of it. And he promises us a hope that one day wholeness is possible again. So right where you are, would you take whatever elements you have, break them, let's uh, pray for them. God, thank you for the broken body of your son, Jesus. This beautiful, sacrifice that reminds us that in our humanity, the brokenness of our emotions, our fears, our doubts, all of the wrestlings that in the midst of that brokenness, God, that you choose to draw near and that you choose to accept us as we are, but not leave us there. Thank you. In the middle of brokenness, there is the promise of wholeness again through Jesus. We thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. You can take the bread. Scripture says, uh, in the same way he took the cup. I don't know what elements you have. I found this little small cup here with some cranberry juice. And scripture says that he took the cup that represented his blood. So often when we come to a moment like this in communion, it's a somber time. But I actually believe it's a celebration time because the blood represents his forgiveness. The blood represents freedom from sin. The blood represents that we are no longer slaves, but we are now free and we have been called sons and daughters of Christ. In this moment, he said, take this drink and every time you do so, remember me, remember the sacrifice, remember the gift. Let's take communion and the element together. Well, we remember together, and as we remember, now let's reflect. Let's reflect on what this means to us in this moment on this Good Friday of 2020. And the worship team, they're going to lead us in a song that I believe is going to resonate with the deep grace that God has for each of us. Let's go for it.
pray with me. Jesus, we're so thankful for your love, God, for your goodness, for your grace, a grace that hasn't been earned, God, a grace that's freely given because you love us and you want a relationship with us. Jesus, would we be more aware in these moments of your grace than any of the other extenuating circumstances that may be calling, God? Would we just be here in your presence and in your love receiving, God? So thankful. We love you so much. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Ephraim Smith, and this has been such a wonderful time. I'm joined by my brother, my tag team partner for the evening, Brandon Short. And uh, I I just want you to remember this as we close this all out. Even in the darkest moment, the crucifixion, there is an open window to hope. I want you to remember this from Luke chapter 23, verse 44. It says, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. Now you could just say, well, where's the hope in that? Mm Jesus has died. The Savior is dead. Ah, but there's verse 47. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man, which means that's why we can call this Good Friday. We can call it Good Friday because even though it's a death, it's a Mm -hmm. tragedy. Ah, centurion recognizes Jesus for who he is and he praises God. I dare you to find your praise even on Good Friday. And with that, I hand it over to my brother, Brandon. And friends, I got nothing to add to that. I've learned you don't follow Ephraim Smith when he comes with truth like that. But what I do want to say in that same light and that same idea of looking forward to hope and even rejoicing now is that this weekend we are going to celebrate Easter. I want to invite you and your family, you and yours, and whoever you know and can invite, even though we're in this shelter-in-place season, we can still go to church together this weekend on Easter. We're going to stream all day Sunday on the Bayside app, on the website, as well as Facebook Live, and we cannot wait to see you there. Thank you again for joining us this Good Friday.